Welcome to Liquid Future. Today, our guest is Brett Hennig, the director and co-founder of the Sortition Foundation, whose aim is to promote the idea of randomly selected legislatures, like juries. Brett has a long experience in this field and experience outside of politics as well as a software engineer, activist, mathematician, father, he even has a PhD in astrophysics. Brett's work is inspired previously by trying to influence policy and government, where he came to the conclusion that we need more systematic reform. So we're really happy to have him. He's been on a roll these last few months doing a lot of great media interviews. Thank you for joining us, Brett. No problem. Happy to be here. So just to lay out the very basics, can you explain at a high level what sortition entails? Yeah, it's basically just randomly selecting a representative sample of people and giving them the political power to make decisions. Uh, it's as simple as that. It's a, a different kind of representation. You actually get a representative bunch of people together who speak or make decisions on behalf of the rest of us. Makes a lot of sense. Is this a new idea? It's actually very old. It goes way back to ancient Athens. Uh, although everyone who knows anything about democracy realizes that in ancient Athens there was the uh, assembly where all free male Athenian citizens could turn up and vote on proposals. What's far less well known is that surrounding the general assembly in Athens were a variety of bodies uh, who drafted legislation, the juries who decided whether legislation was uh, legal, and those were all selected using sortition, using random selection. And has it been seen at all in the modern world? So you're talking about 2000 years ago. What's the, what's the history between then and now? So, uh, so I mean, the word democracy in the ancient world meant random selection. Uh, it wasn't until after the French Revolution, the American revolutions, when uh, new structures were being set up and they were trying to figure out what they should replace hereditary aristoc aristocracies with, that they came up with this idea that maybe we should use elections. But if you look at Aristotle or if you look at Rousseau or Montesquieu, they all say that elections are just a different form of aristocracy. And in fact, even if you look at the Founding Fathers' documents, uh, you'll see that people like John Adams, the second president of the US, says things like, there is a key uh, difference between representatives and democracy. Uh, and so when they were electing people, they were of course constraining the vote to uh, rich white men typically in those times. And it wasn't until much later that what we now call democracy became called democracy, if you like. Yeah. And I think you're, there's a sort of implicit piece there about what the term aristocracy even means itself. Because my understanding is the term originally meant rule by best in the literal Greek sense. And throughout the medieval period, it came to mean this hereditary, the noble families passing on through, through heirs and such. But that the original idea of rule by the best does resemble the idealized version of elections. We're going to hold an election and whoever the community decides is the best, those will be our rulers. So there is that intricate link. Is that right? Yeah, it's, it's very complicated. I get it's, it's quite subtle and complicated. I mean, nowadays we would call rule by the best a meritocracy or something. Um, but yeah, it is true that in, in the past aristocracy, they thought meant rule by the best. Is democracy, as we now see it, based on the idea that they are the, the best in whatever that sense means? Or is it based on the idea that in theory you vote for someone who will pursue your interests or whose promises you make you wish to pursue? Um, I mean, what if you ever throw in this word, the best, the best at what? The best at satisfying the, the desires of the constituents or the best at uh, push, pushing your interests in government? Um, you know, you could talk about this for many for a long time as well. So what is the problem right now with electoral representative systems as, as we see them? 
the electoral system is essentially captured by vested interests and lobbyists, etc. Um, to, to be elected to, for example, the national legislature in the US, you of course have to have a war chest of money. You have to have a vast network of wealthy donors, typically, not always, of course. There are, there are some uh, prominent exa recent examples of people uh, raising a lot of money with very small donations. Um, and once, but once you get into power, who you are surrounded by is a very unrepresentative bunch of people in general. Uh, half of US senators and Congress people are millionaires, for example. Um, so once you get a bunch of millionaires together to make the laws, it's not surprising that in general the laws they make uh, support the, their own views, their own uh, take on society. So if you really believe that democracy should be about representing the will of the people, there's lots of great studies out there that show that it's not. Yeah. Yes, the electoral system is misrepresentative. Essentially, yeah. Affluence and Influence. Uh, uh, there's a great book called Affluence and Influence. Uh, there's uh, another book by Archens and Bartels um, called Democracy for Realists. Uh, these books detail how the people that we elect essentially uh, are following affluent interests. Okay. Yeah, and, and I, I exactly you said, I think there's a huge amount of evidence of that objectively, as well as survey data that shows that the people recognize this and, and see that. Yeah if, you, if, yeah, if you look at uh, the data of who people trust the most as well, this is also very interesting. People trust doctors and nurses to a very high degree. People uh, trust scientists and they trust NGOs. If you then ask them, do you trust politicians? It's a ridiculously small amount of people who trust politicians. People, in a sense, just assume that they are pursuing their own self-interest or their own desire to obtain power. Um, so that to me is not an ideal democracy. Uh, and so what Sortition aims to do is, uh, is get closer to the ideal. Yeah. Yeah, I, I wanted to get into that deeper. So sometimes you'll hear the argument that, you know, you raise doctors, for example, and someone says, you know, you wouldn't want some someone with no experience performing surgery upon you. you want someone that has that's dedicated their lives to it. And so people will make the argument that for the exact same reason you want a it's a good thing to have professional politicians, professional political scientists. I take it you don't necessarily agree with that argument? Uh, that there's, I mean, for, <laughs> can I just say the word Trump or is that? <laughs> yeah. <not allowed? laughs> no, I mean, please, it, by all means. Yeah, uh, if you assume that, of course, uh, a politician should be a professional, then uh, what, what you have now in the US is a very unprofessional politician. Um, but there's, there's a key fallacy in that analogy, actually. Uh, of course, you people are willing to hand over uh, the power over themselves to an expert um, in a field where it's their choice. So you will choose to go under an anesthetic and have that doctor operate on you. And of course, you want an expert to do that. But when you are talking about making decisions about how to uh, manage and allocate shared resources in, a, in society, and how to make decisions about people who will have power over you regardless. Um, for example, there people have power to in a government to force you to obey the law and put you in prison if you don't. So in these decisions, you want to have some democratic system and it's not necessarily true that experts are the best people to make those decisions. This is essentially what the the Chinese, the Chinese Communist Party argues, it says that you actually need experts who are ideologically pure to run the country. Um, in a democracy, hopefully, you actually have a representative group of people who listen to the will of the people. Yeah, and I, I think there's also a distinction about the, the time elapsed in this example. You know, you, you work with a doctor, maybe they treat you for a week or even a month, but you can very quickly see I'm satisfied with their service or I'm not satisfied with the service. I'm going to go find somebody different. And that's happened. I mean, I have a family member that's that's in intensive care over the last three months and they've gone through 24, 25 different doctors. And it's uh, 
it's a frustrating experience, but it's nice that we have, that we're not stuck with one person for four years. Yeah, yeah. And Whereas we have in, a lot in, more flexibility. Yes, so that's the, the key point with these experts is that, yeah, you have the, the ultimately you have the power to walk away, etc. Um, whereas with people who are making laws, uh, I mean, the only power you have is to try to influence those laws, to lobby for those laws. You, you must obey those laws or risk being put in prison, etc. Yeah. So what do you find is the common reaction when you talk to your average person off the street about sortition? incredulity <laughs> people laugh and just say you really want to give uh, some random people power that's just crazy you know everyone comes up with some anecdote about how their insane neighbor what if they got chosen what if uh, what if that guy who smashed my car up or whatever you know got chosen um of course and the word random itself actually has uh, very negative connotations often. You know, it's been a random event is generally a bad event. Chaos. Chaos, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. So um, if you can get past immediate dismissal, uh, then you can have a, a discussion about the, the proposal. And often, if you actually do get to that stage, people will come back even a day later or a week later and go, actually, yeah, wow, I can see how that would work and would fix so many problems. Um, but yeah, the, the initial reaction is, is typically dismissal, immediate dismissal as, as uh, ridiculous. As soon as you start talking about citizens' assemblies and give them some examples of where it's worked and how it works, yeah, you, you can actually have a very good conversation. Yeah. And, and of course, the most prominent example in America that I can think of is the jury selection process. I mean, we just assume that justice means a jury of our peers. Yeah, yeah. And so... And the why would we accept that unquestioningly for our judicial criminal justice system and not for our legislative system? Yeah, indeed. It's based on the jury principle. Uh, and this is not to say that actually the, the, the legal jury system doesn't have some serious problems, of course. Um, but for the most part, it's a respected uh, way to come to a decision. The, these 12 people in the courtroom are in theory there representing the rest of society. Uh, and it's the same principle. In theory, they will come to the same opinion that the, anyone of society would have come to given the time and information to deliberate and look at the facts, etc. So a citizen's assembly or a sortition assembly is based on exactly the same principle, that you hope that this group of representative people would simulate how the whole of society would actually think and would actually come to the same decision. And now in the jury selection process, of course, we have this this selection period where the, the two litigators can veto certain representatives. Do you imagine that a similar mechanism is necessary for sortition? No, I think that's probably one of the main problems with some of the jury system, actually, that ability to veto uh, potential members. Um, I mean, one common question is, of course, would there have to be some minimum standard uh, of education or something for these people to be uh, randomly selected? I feel fairly strongly that other than uh, perhaps ex or excluding people who are in prison, etc., like for jury service, uh, there shouldn't be any of these situations. It was exactly the same kind of reasoning which was used uh, to exclude uh, black Americans from registering to vote. You know, if they can't read, they shouldn't be allowed to vote, etc. Um, so I would actually just allow anyone to be randomly selected. Uh, I would make it voluntary. So if you do say yes, I'd want to be on this service. Uh, if you say no, you don't have to be. Um, I would make sure that the they get reimbursed at a sufficient uh, wage to make it actually attractive to a vast majority of the population. And now would the the citizens assembly be in your, your idealized mind and of course there's going to be a lot of experimentation here but in your idealized form do you imagine the citizen assembly is focused on one particular policy question or are they addressing the entire conglomerate of questions just like our current legislatures do so t to date the the experiments with citizens assemblies and policy juries etc they have typically addressed one policy question uh, so they come together, they address that policy question over a period of weeks or months, and then they disperse. And for the next question, you get another group of people together. 
Uh, the one, one of the main exceptions to that was the Irish Citizens Assembly, which addressed like five or six different policy options. They addressed the constitutional ban on abortion. They addressed climate change. Uh, they addressed fixed term parliaments, I think it was. Um, so there's no reason, I don't think, why one Citizens Assembly couldn't address the whole array of policy options. And in fact, no reason why it couldn't actually form a legislative changer in, a chamber, in my opinion. Um, the, these recent examples, such as the observatory in the city of Madrid, where they have now instituted a randomly selected body to sit beside the elected chamber, they can address any and every topic that the chamber addresses, the elected chamber, and also that comes through their Madrid Direct Democracy online platform. So can you speak to these existing examples? How, how did they get enacted in the first place? And what have the results been? Uh, so they're both very, very recent. Uh, they have both just been passed in the, in the first few months of 2019. Uh, the Madrid uh, Assembly was essentially the outcome of uh, the Indignados movement in Spain, which was a precursor to the Occupy movement. Uh, they essentially became, uh, in Madrid at least, a group of people who were involved in the Indignados movement formed a political party, and uh, they now may be the second largest party in the city of Madrid, I think, and they came in on a platform of promising direct democracy and more participatory democracy. And so as part of their pledge, in a sense, their mandate, that they have been implementing uh, sortition as part of that process. In Belgium, there's a very small region called the, uh, the German-speaking region of Belgium. And they were simply inspired by the idea that democracy should be done differently and that they wanted to be one of the first people to try uh, to re reincarnate this sortition democracy, if you like. Um, so the politicians there, they came together, they invited a whole group of experts in and they said, how would we uh, institute a sortition system here? And so what they've done is actually very interesting. They have the elected chamber and they now have a sortition body that uh, sets an agenda for a few different citizens assemblies uh, populated by different groups of people. And then after you've been through a citizens assembly, you are eligible to be randomly selected for one year to the main body who sets the agenda for the next year. Um, it's a very interesting multi-body sortition system, if you like. And is there is it too early to say whether these or uh, whether these citizens assemblies are working? How, how do we know that they if they were working? Let's put it that way. So, so these permanent uh, bodies that have just been instituted in the last few months, it's too early to say where, where they are working. But we now have decades of experience of one-off citizens' assemblies, and, and we know they work. We know they work very well. I mean, there's, a key, there's key elements that must come together, such as uh, independent facilitators and a good process and uh, a good uh, unbiased board of experts, etc., uh, but these people can achieve and do successfully do this. So, for example, in Australia, they've now had about 30 of these citizens' assemblies. In Canada, in Toronto, Mass LBP has organized over 30 as well, I think. Um, in Germany, there's been planning cells for decades since the 70s. So this random selection process of coming together and deciding on different policy options is, is proven to work. It's just a matter of actually trying to get it to be institutionalized and become a permanent feature of our democracy. And the, the examples you named in Spain and Belgium, in both cases, in the Belgian case, the politicians have pushed for it. In the Spanish case, um, you said that this was part of the pledge of the candidates for office. So they had to first win electoral office and then enact it. Is it you know, there's a cynical part of me that is concerned that uh, there's like a conflict of interest here between the existing power structures giving up, you know, voluntarily giving up power. Is that something? Is that something to be concerned about? I mean, how, can this be done in a system that's? Do you see a path to this happening? For example, in the U.S., as we were talking about earlier, it seems to be just mired in and uh, self-interest rather than common. Interest. 
Yeah, uh, I could see it happening first at a local level. So I could see uh, like a city council or something, or perhaps even a state legislature, who there was enough people elected to that body who really agreed or who really understood that the democratic system was broken and went, let's try something different. And maybe if we try something different at the state level or the city level, that would become an inspiration for the rest of the country and for a national level. So in some sense, it's it could be driven by politicians who are looking to make a historical break and to go down in the history books as democratic innovators. And I think that's what happened in Belgium. So in the US, I would be concentrating my efforts at a, at a state level or at a city level. Um, and in fact, there are some groups in the US uh, pursuing these kind of activities. There's Healthy Democracy uh, who are pursuing this uh, kind of activity. Uh, there's also the Jefferson Center. Uh, and they're, you know, they've been promoting citizens' juries for years. So moving, expanding their work out and then trying to institutionalize that is the next step, I think. But it, yeah, of course, it's going to have to start locally. I think there's no hope of it happening at a national level in, you know, in the next <laughs> electoral cycle or whatever. So just to step back for a second, there's so much to talk about here, but uh, what can you elaborate a little bit more on what the mechanics of of the idealized citizens jury actually looks like in terms of how are the people picked in the first place? Um, what is their mandate? What is their legal uh, power? It, can they make the final decision on the law? Is it more of an advisory role? And what is the process? How, how long is the assembly assembled? And um, I, I think there's an implicit thing in there about having experts come and make their case before the assembly. So yeah, can you just elaborate a little bit more on on the specifics of, of what we could be doing here? Yeah. So uh, all the citizens assemblies to date, no, not all of them, actually, most of them uh, have been advisory. So these people come together, uh, the government says, I would like to have an answer on this question. Uh, and they come together and they debate the question and they give their answer and then the government reacts. In certain circumstances, uh, one for example in South Australia, 300 people came together and talked about whether they should have a nuclear waste dump in the outback of South Australia. These 300 people came back to the government and said, no, we don't think you should. And there was so much media attention that that killed that policy option. Uh, the, the, the South Australian government could not pursue that option anymore because it had been shown through a, a legitimate process to be undesirable. Uh, the, the same more or less happened uh, with the Irish Assembly. The Citizens Assembly came and said, yes, you should definitely remove this constitutional ban on abortion. Of course, it was a constitutional matter, so it had to go to a, a referendum, but the government immediately put it to a referendum uh, and the outcome was virtually the same as the Citizens Assembly, about a two thirds majority. There are some examples in Gdansk in Poland where the city council agreed to be bound by the decision of this citizens assembly uh, if it had an 80% consensus. Uh, so the city, the assembly came together, 80% of the people or more agreed to do this and the city council then went ahead and did that. Um, now if it was actually institutionalized, and if you actually had a second chamber, uh, what powers that would have would very much depend on the system. Uh, in the UK, if they replace the House of Lords, maybe it would just have the same power as the current House of Lords, which is basically to delay legislation. If in the US they replace the Senate with a randomly selected group of people, maybe it would have the existing powers of the Senate. Um, this is something that's yeah very open to debate. Um, in terms of how it actually works, Again, it's, it's very dependent on where you are. So in many European countries, the government actually has database of every name and address of every person living in the country. In uh, the UK, the US, Australia, these sorts of databases don't exist, but they do have electoral roles. So essentially what you would do would be randomly select 10,000 people from an electoral role or from whatever the best database you can get you send them an invitation to register their interest. Out of all the people who then say, yes, I'm willing to do this, and you will typically get a, 
an over-representative sample in terms of you'll get more older people, you'll get more highly educated people, etc. You then do a second random selection from all those who respond, controlling that you tick all the boxes, that you match the census data, essentially, so that you, even if 75% of the people who respond are men, you make sure that you select 50% men, 50% women, for example. Um, if not many 18 to 29 year olds respond, you make sure you select enough to get a representative sample. So this is the way it's been done in the US, Canada, and now in Australia. Uh, and that's the way I would do it if it was populating legislative assembly. You basically have to go through two rounds of random, random selection. And this also makes it very hard to capture the system, to try to infiltrate or to try to somehow uh, you know, corrupt that selection process. Wonderful. And then once the once the members are picked, how long could would you expect them to be deliberating? Are we talking about a week? Are we talking about six months? Are we talking about four years? Yeah. Uh, in Madrid, uh, they have one year terms, and those people who are selected in Madrid, they actually don't give up their day jobs. They are just meeting for like one weekend a month. I think it is. Uh, for the whole year and then another group of people are coming in. Um, in Belgium, I think it's a very similar situation. Uh, the group is going to come together. Well, actually, the Belgian is, is not, it's not very similar. <laughs> actually, the Belgian situation is quite different because the permanent body there who are also serving for one year are just setting the agenda of various citizens' assemblies and then being replaced. If it formed actually uh, uh, like a Senate, say the US Senate was replaced with a sortition body, um, I could see them serving one or two year terms. And you may want to have a staggered process where, say, every six months you replace a quarter of those people. So that there's an element of continuity, of institutional memory, uh, and an element of new people coming in. Um, potentially, you would want to have them go through some induction phase where they learn how laws are made, you know, the whole process of lawmaking, uh, you know, to consider ethical considerations. Um, yeah, it's, it's very dependent on where it happened, how it would happen. I mean, there's some key similarities, but yeah, it's, it's geographically, Definitely. yeah. And then a, a key part of the process is having expert witnesses come and, and testify on the pros and cons of different policy decisions, right? Yep. So, so, so how, please. Yeah, you're going to ask how they're selected, I assume. <laughs> uh, also a very common question, of course, uh, because everyone assumes that uh, these people would be prey to expert influence, essentially just become puppets uh, of the experts. Um, what we find in practice is that is definitely not the case. Uh, and it, if people are given enough time and a bit of internal training as well, so often, uh, for example, in Australia, when they select these juries, they will these assemblies, they will put the participants through uh, a few sessions of recognizing expert bias and what critical thinking is, etc. Sometimes, if they have the time, they'll actually even ask the assembly, "Who do you want to hear from?" And they'll give the assembly the power to choose which experts they want to hear from on this topic from a, a given selection. What you also typically institute is a, an, a, an oversight body who tries to make sure that the range of experts is balanced and you're producing fair information. Um, what they can also do is produce a, a, like a, a pamphlet or something stating the, the views and highlighting where the experts disagree and how strong the disagreement is. So, what? Well, yeah, they've done pretty well so far. When I was talking about the, the having a nuclear waste dump in the outback of South Australia, of course you had the environmentalists lobbying, of course you had the pro-business lobby, and these people would come and present, and present quite differing uh, information. And that's where the, the, the deliberation comes into it. So the citizens sitting together and saying, this person said that and that made me say this and just bouncing ideas off each other and sort of correcting each other and self-correcting each other in a large diverse group uh, is a really powerful tool of getting to really good decisions. And is it, is it 
Do you imagine there's a role similar to a prosecutor or like a defense attorney right now where there's some key figure responsible for pushing one angle to convince the, the citizen jury? Um, no, I'd hope that the experts, in a sense, uh, I'd love to see every expert who came to address one of these assemblies stand up and say, you know, I promise, <laughs> put their hand on the Bible or whatever, and say, I promise to try to give you an independent, unbiased view. Of course, it's impossible. Uh, everyone is biased in some way. But to have them even try to acknowledge their own personal bias is really important. What is really key in the process actually is the facilitation. And so how do you facilitate lots of small, because typically what they do if you have 100 people, you would have 10 tables of 10 people. And each table is busy deliberating together with a trained facilitator making sure that no one dominates the discussion, making sure that everyone gets to have a, a fair say, making sure that they don't go off track and start talking about the weather or something. Um, and the power of these facilitators, people are always uh, often say, oh, actually you will have like a dictatorship of the facilitators. So all, also these people have to be very well trained and uh, to be neutral and unbiased. Luckily, what we find is that when participants of citizens' assemblies rank their facilitators on were they unbiased, did they try to steer the conversation? If you have trained, skilled facilitators, they don't do that. Um. Makes sense. So you had mentioned earlier, I know we're running short on time, but you had mentioned earlier about um, in Ireland, the Citizens Assembly came up with one recommendation, but it involved a constitutional change. And so then it had to be put to a referendum. And so my question is just, can, can you compare the distinction between a citizen's assembly and a referendum? Because in terms of representativeness, wouldn't you expect a, a full referendum to also, also capture the will of people? What are the pros and cons here? Yeah, um, I, I am not a fan of referendums. Uh, the reason I'm not a fan for, of referendums is that I think it gives you uh, that, well, there's many reasons, but one is that it, it's a kind of, uh, it's a fast thinking response. It's a kind of a knee jerk reaction in a sense. Yes, no. Yeah. So, I mean, my ideal of democracy is that you want to arrive at a decision after having listened to experts and after having deliberating, after having had to give not only what you think, but also why you think the way you think. And it, you should have to actually have some back and forth between people and say, well, I think this because of this. And they say, well, I think this because of that. And this act of giving reasons can actually change people's opinions. Now, this is not what happens in electoral democracy, and it's certainly not what happens in a, a referendum. So my ideal is, of course, okay, if we could get everyone together and give them all balanced information and get them all to deliberate together, this is my ideal democracy. We can't. That's unfeasible. People have lives to live, etc., etc. So what we can do is simulate that process. Uh, and a referendum in no way simulates that process. And specifically, when you said this doesn't happen in electoral democracy, this doesn't happen in a referendum, you're talking about people changing their opinion? Yeah, and actually having to give, yeah, and having to say, I believe this because of this, and listening to someone else who says, well, I believe it because of this, and actually listening and considering. Of course, everyone in our current electoral democracy is just trying to give sound bites and just trying to satisfy a very small lobby group or something, or they're always thinking, oh, if I say that, that'll look really bad in the media, so I should say this. Um, yeah, this, this process in a citizen's assembly where you can sit down and honestly give your opinion in front of other people who will honestly react to you, it just doesn't happen, of course. Um. And so you kind of just uh, sparked a question in my mind, in to what extent are these deliberations private? Because right now our jury deliberation is, is private, right? And that's seen as, I, I'm not 100% sure on the background of it, but I think it's seen as vital to the process. Whereas in theory, the deliberation happening in the Senate is ostensibly supposed to be happening out in the open. Of course, a lot the, the reality is happening behind closed doors, but yeah, what's the take on that? 
Yeah, I mean, I would follow the the jury process and actually have the personal deliberations private. Uh, whether you would have the final vote, so they're deliberating about a yes or no question or something, at some point they have to stop and say, okay, let's vote yes or no. Would you make that voting record public? Yeah, there's interesting pros and cons for that. Um, but yeah, certainly the deliberations I would make private or you just fall into the same argument that people grandstand that, that they do it because they know this is going to get their, get them on the 9 o'clock news or the 6 o'clock news or whatever. Um, so yeah, I would probably keep the deliberations uh, private. This has certainly been the practice with all the citizens' assemblies to date. Often they may live stream the expert presentations. So other experts and other people can see and say, oh, that expert said this and, you know, that would also be a balance and a check on expert bias. But no, I, I would keep the deliberations private. That makes sense. And of course, in, in, in current juries, there's an expectation that they reach a unanimous decision. But the context there is we're talking about sending somebody to prison or not. So it's a little different. So is it the case that you wouldn't need or expect a unanimous decision with, with citizens' assemblies? Yeah, no, you wouldn't need or expect a unanimous decision. Uh, what they find in practice is that often uh, groups tend towards a consensus, um, but it's, it's, it's never 100%. There's always uh, people who say no. If It would be an interesting measure of how contentious uh, a topic is. If it was really knife edge, 51%, 49%, that may just be an indication that you need more time, more deliberation, more information. So it might be an interesting way of uh, guarding against, yeah, two abrupt decisions or something. Um, if you obviously had like an 80% decision, then it would be clear that everyone thinks that way. Um, and so therefore you can go with, with that process. Yeah, yeah, a friend of mine likes to say, 51% majority means half the people are unhappy. Yeah. What sort of democracy is that? Yeah, yeah. And that's only 51% of those who voted, who could vote. <laughs> yeah, so where, where can people go to learn more? Uh, so I'm the co-founder, director of the Sortition Foundation. So you can go to sortitionfoundation.org. Uh, I've written a book called The End of Politicians' Time for Real Democracy, which you can find online, of course. Uh, there's actually a new book that's just come out called Legislature by Lot, uh, of which I've written one chapter, contributed one chapter to that book. Wonderful. And are you active on the social media or, or newsletters or anything like that that, that you want to direct people towards? Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, Sortition Foundation has a Facebook page, of course. Uh, also uh, at Sortition Now on Twitter. Uh, I'm on Twitter as well at, at BS Hennig. Um, I also have a Facebook page, of course. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for, for sharing and thank you for working at this for so long. And hopefully we'll have many further great deliberations. Yeah, great. Cheers. Cheers.